back again. Mouth is Marty, and uh, I guess we should start off by show the, the show by by wishing our Jewish New Year's a our Jewish viewers a happy New Year. Our Jewish viewers a happy New Year. And uh, the year on the Jewish calendar is five thousand seven hundred and fifty-three. And uh, we got up on the board there in uh, Jewish numerical format, which uh, see the camera guys do not bother to twig into this thing because they didn't realize they've written the numbers on the board, but that's how they write them in the, in the style of the Jewish calendar. Oh, it's, it's there. There's that contrast coming in. Look at that, eh? No, don't pay attention. I look at that. Okay. I'm looking at the wrong monitor anyhow. Yeah, but that looks real good. Tough, sheen, noon, gimel. Totally looks like you can get the whole thing, right? Yeah, so I'm just kind of clipping the edge of those letters. Well, no one can read them anyhow. And, uh... Zoom out a bit, you guys. Yeah, that's there how it go. looks. It's, yeah. it's, it's kind of an, an old-fashioned way to have a representing the numbers, and, and uh, I'm not really going to explain how that works. Um, I should really be sort of sleeping off... Uh, well, I was like at my mother's house for, for, for New Year's dinner. Okay, so ate like uh, ate like a pig, kosher pig, of course, and uh, and uh, so I should be sort of relaxing, sort of on a sofa, sleeping it off. But here we are on TV. You see, we, we tape we tape on a Sunday night, and this will this will air on the Tuesday night. So technically, it'll still be Jewish New Year's when we go on on air. And, uh, and uh, 5,753. And uh, I, know, I don't know what that represents in terms of actual chronology because no one ever told me, like, the line in the Bible where they count from year zero, whether it's from Adam or Genesis or what. I mean, you'd think it's, you'd think it's from uh, the creation of, uh, creation of the world. But you see, the Christian scholars at some point in the 19th century, they kind of calculated that, uh, that it was 6,000 years since creation. Isn't there such a figure kicking around that it's been 6,000 years? You heard of that. You guys have heard of that? Okay, so no one's heard of it. Okay, I, I know for a fact that there's these sort of Christian scholars that calculate that it's 6,027 years or something. So, so the Jewish figure, 5,753, I don't know what it corresponds to in terms of the Christian figure because they're working off the same Bible. But, you know, if it's not from a, if we're not counting from creation, the point is no one ever sat me down with the Bible and pointed out a red mark and said, this is year zero on the Jewish calendar, whether it's from the time of the flood or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah or the birth of Abraham or what have you. You know, I never saw what it corresponds to, but that's the year. So. To all our Jewish viewers, a happy new year and best wishes for a year to come. And, uh, okay, we got, uh, we got a guest on, Mr. Barsby's back with another one of his uh, patented math topics. And I think we'll, you see, John, you've been, you went on holidays before, before it started school year and just got back. We're back for the two days. You've been back since right. September. You haven't been feeling all that hot since you came back. Well, I'm, I'm fine now, Marty. Well, it's nice to have you here. Where, where were you? I, I was in China. China. Okay. And you ate too much Chinese food. Because that must have been it. Well, yeah. okay. Well, it's nice to have you back. Now get up there and do your job. <laughs> okay. Here's some chalk. Okay. Um, my topic today, if you can uh, call it a topic, is <laughs> not much a brush. <laughs> this is a wooden block, <laughs> Marty. What do you use that for? <laughs> That's useless to you. Get rid of that stuff. My topic today, if you can call it a topic, is simply interesting numbers. Now, um, before I get launched into anything about interesting numbers, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little story of, oh, this has got to be about 10 years ago now, maybe not quite that long. But I had a grade 10 class at St. John's Ravens course, but it uh, was a very good group. And one e time on the first of the month, I think, it, uh, I think it was February, I went in and wrote the date on the blackboard, and I had the one, of course, February 1. And uh, I looked at it, and 
I launched into this description of all the properties of one that made it a special number, properties of multiplication and so on, and the fact that it has fewer divisors than any other number, and therefore it's neither prime nor composite, and forgot all about it. But the next day, and I could still see that class in front of me, I know exactly who was in it. Perhaps some of your Math with Marty fans were in it, people like Kava Sojania and Sandy Dick and Karen Mehta. And maybe some of them are watching tonight. Anyway, Kava, who sat uh, near the back, said the next day, tell us about the number two. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> okay. so uh, th there I was on the spot, but of course two was the only even prime number, so it, it was easy to come up with some reason why two was a special and unique number. And maybe it was about that time the weekend saved me. I don't really know where the weekends came. But I remember going through the entire month, scratching my head each night before I went into class, trying to find something that made the, uh, the number of that particular date unique, or if not unique, at least uh, special. We did talked about perfect numbers, we talked about Mersenne primes, we uh, talked about triangular numbers. I remember talking about the special properties that uh, fractions have if their denominator can be expressed totally in terms of products of two and five. And sometimes before the month was over, I was really scratching my head. I remember being desperate when I got to 14. I wrote 14 on a piece of paper the night before and wrote 2 times 7 and looked at various partitions of 14, and I think I just about gave up on 14. I remember going in with something kind of weak and lame about uh, the British weight system with 14 pounds to a stone. And of course, that make, makes 112 pounds to 100 weight, which is kind of unusual, and 2,240 pounds to the ton. The students seemed rather interested, but I felt I had somehow let them down without having any mathematical property. Some of the numbers were certainly much harder than others. Some of my, my reasons were pretty lame. But there, there's a few I'd like to look at, and there's a few other numbers I want to mention, too. But let's just look at the perfect numbers, because there were two of them that month. And the perfect numbers are the numbers like 6. And the divisors of 6, the proper divisors, if I don't include 6 itself, are 1 and 2 and 3. And those uh, divisors add up to the number 6. And the next perfect number we encountered that month was uh, 28. And of course, its divisors are 1 and 2 and 4 and 7 and 14. I hope I haven't left any out. That looks as if it adds up to 28. And um, on the 7th of the month, I remember talking about Mersenne Prime. If I can spell it. Perhaps it's something like that. And a Mersenne prime, and I'm kind of scribbling all over the blackboard here, but a Mersenne prime is one that is one less than a power of, uh, of two. And um, if I take that, I get the, uh, the, the second biggest Mersenne prime. Of course, there's second smallest. Second I mean. smallest, right. Of course, okay. there's one that's smaller. If I Three is a Mersenne prime. Eh? That's okay. right. If I take that, I've got the smallest. And one of the interesting things about the even perfect numbers is that every one of them can be written as the product of a Mersenne prime and some other number. This one is 4 times 7. 7 is a Mersenne prime. This one is 2 times 3, and 3 is a Mersenne prime. And in general, all the even perfect numbers are generated by a formula that, uh, that looks uh, like this. I may have to look at it a little more carefully after I write it to make sure I've got the n and the n minus 1 in the right position. I think I should make that one the n minus 1. Right. 
so that, for instance, if n were 3, I would get 8 minus 1, which is 7, and I would get 4 times 7 is 28. Okay, so what you're saying is that if that thing in brackets is a prime number, that's right. Then this formula should generate a, a perfect number. That's right. Okay. If this expression in brackets is prime, and it's not always going to be prime, no. for instance, if n is 4, I'm going to get 15 in the brackets, and then it's it just generates prime. garbage. Okay. But if, the, if this part in the brackets is prime, then this will generate a perfect number. Which means that the factors at number add up, add up to the number okay. itself. So the next Fantastic. one that we would get would be if n is 5. If n is 5, I get 2 to the 5th minus 1, which is 31. Multiply that by 2 to the 4th, which is 16, and you get the next uh, smallest perfect number. Now, 31 times 16, I don't know these from memory, unfortunately, but it looks as if it's 496 is the, uh, the third perfect number. You want to check it out? See what adds up. To well, it. I think I'll uh, I'll assume it's going to work out. Okay. Because there's there's a lot of divisors to four. Oh yeah, because 31 goes into it, 62 goes in. Um, for that matter, 124 goes in. That's right. Not to mention. Uh, well, you can tell okay. exactly how many divisors there are actually because this is the 31. That's a prime number. Yeah. If I multiplied five times two, there's ten yeah. divisors. It wouldn't be too hard to list them all, but. Uh, I'm sure if I did, they would work out. Oh, you can sort of see why they have to work out if you, th if you think about it, because you're, you're going to get half the number, a quarter of the number, an eighth of the number, and everything right down to, uh, right down to, to two and one. That, that's right. Yeah. Actually, looking to see why they, uh, why they work out, if I can just t use that one as an example. Yeah, I could just, just, just write them down, 200 and I could, I could 248. I could prove yeah. this in general, but let's just do it for this particular example, and you should see a pattern that would yeah. extend in general. If you look at the divisors, remember that's 31, yeah. so I've got 16 times 31. I'm going to list the divisors like this, the proper divisors. I'm going to list 1, and beside it I'm going to put 31. Okay. And I'm going to list 2, and beside it I'm going to put 2 times 31, okay. and I'm going to list 4. And beside it, I'm going to put 4 times 31. Okay. And I'm going to list uh, the next one, which is 8. And beside it, I'm going to put 8 times 31. And the last is 16. And beside it, I'm going to put 16 times 31. Now, that last one is actually the number itself. Yeah. Okay. So if I add up all the divisors, including the number itself, I'm going to get twice the number itself. Okay. And uh, here's a sneaky little way of adding it up that shows that that will work. If I remember how this goes, when I add 1 and a 31, uh, I'm going to get 1 plus 31. When I add a 2 and a 2 times 31, factor a 2 out of there, and I'm going to get 2 times 1 plus 31. Okay. When I do this one, I'm going to get 4 times 1 plus 31. Here I'm going to get 8 times 1 plus 31. Here I'm going to get 16 times 1 plus 31. Yeah. And now, when I add those up, I'm going to add this column. I'm going to pull the 1 plus 31 out as a common factor. Yeah. And I'm just adding 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16. Which is 31. Which is 31. Okay. Um, is that right? 31 times 32, yeah. That's twice 31 times 16, which is what it's supposed to be. Right, right. Yeah. And this, this would generalize to, to any, uh, any, any number you want, but this has got to be a... So every Mersenne prime is going to generate a perfect number. Right. Yeah, okay. But this was kind of a side track okay. that I was getting into. Um, my real topic was interesting numbers, of which this is just one example. But how is our time coming, Marty? I never pay attention to when these breaks come. Uh, I do know. I have time to launch into a proof that uh, all numbers are interesting? Yeah, give her. Unless we should do a song first. Well, this is a short proof. I'll okay, do the proof do the and proof. then you go into okay. the song. This, this is very interesting. It's one of these kind of pseudo-mathematical proofs that, uh, that I rather enjoy. I'm going, to, I'm going to convince you and Neil that all numbers are interesting. And I'm going to do this through uh, 
proof by contradiction. And the proof is simply like this. Assume that some numbers are not interesting. Now, let's create the set of all uninteresting numbers. Now, because the numbers are well-ordered, we can always put these numbers in the set in order. So from this set, let x be the smallest number. Now we have x, which is the smallest uninteresting number. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that contradiction. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's a pretty bad. Uh, it pretty is. Bad proof. It is. It's rather feeble. Because, yeah. mm -hmm. like, how interesting is the second smallest <laughs> interesting number? Oh, but the, no, but the set changes. <laughs> oh, it's not. It, yeah. It's, uh -huh. If it's the second smallest uninteresting number, then it's the smallest uninteresting number by definition, since the first smallest wasn't. Okay. So, so I think you'd better do a okay. song, Marty. <laughs> so what have we got now? Do we have any songs? Uh, well, Marty, you know, we frequently, <laughs> <laughs> we often play uh, fantastic songs by our contemporary uh, creative uh, artists, and uh, I thought you might want to uh, play the people a song written by one of the great hit makers of, the, of yesterday. <laughs> well, it's uh, funny you should ask me, <laughs> but, uh, you know, here's a, a fantastic song by by Frederick Chopin. And, and people who, who learn to play classical piano, you know, at a certain point in your life, I guess when you were a teenager, it seemed to be the common experience that people wanted, people wanted to play Chopin, everything they could, they could get by Chopin, a fantastic kind of romantic style of, of, of classical piano stuff exemplified by this beautiful Chopin waltz, which I'm gonna execute for you on TV right now. <laughs> Thing about classical music, okay. Uh, how many songs of that caliber are there? I mean, there couldn't be there couldn't be all that many songs all that that, that are as good as that one. But uh, you had the hunger to to find out find out it, all, all the ones you could. So when I was like 18 years old, I, I I became aware of this one. I wanted to learn it, and then I bought the the book. It's a Chopin waltz. And then it turns out there's a book of Chopin waltz. So I got the book. Turns out there's a couple more in that book, almost as good as this one the famous uh, minute waltz, and, and, and there's a B-flat B waltz. 